All right, hey there guys. Today we're gonna to be comparing these two systems right here. This is a ITX mini PC that I put together with a Ryzen 5 5600G, the previous generation of desktop APUs, and these were kind of around for a while. Now you could still buy this APU today and it's even available at very low prices on sites like AliExpress. You could even get some very cheap AM4 motherboards nowadays. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to take this APU and I wanted to compare it to the Ryzen 5 60 6600H. Now this is an interesting comparison because these are two drastically different solutions here and I'm very curious what the difference is actually going to be like. See the Ryzen 5 5600G is rocking a Zen 3 CPU paired with seven Vega graphics cores. Now we've seen that configuration before in many other mini PCs but the difference with this desktop platform is that one the GPU can be overclocked and we're overclocking at 2.2 gigahertz and we're able to use faster RAM. See, one of the things about the very small size of mini PCs like this is the fact that to fit everything in here, you have to use compact components. If, uh, if you look at a normal DIMM of DDR4 memory, which is about the same size as DDR5, you'll see that uh, it won't fit in here in any realistic configuration. So you're stuck using itty bitty little laptop memory like this. And unfortunately, one of the downsides of that is the fact that the memory that you're stuck using on a system like this is is going to only be running at JDEC speeds. Now JDEC is essentially the standard that is set for RAM speed. So if you're building a server or if you're buying computers that are meant to run at a school or some kind of organization or company, you're not gonna be buying sticks that run off of XMP because XMP is an overclock. And consequently, on a 5000 series APU, the fastest laptop memory that you can get is 3200 megahertz, which is the same speed as the RAM that we have in here, but the timings are much looser. And what that means then is that what a iGPU wants the most is bandwidth and latency. So with 3200 megahertz, we're looking at the exact same amount of bandwidth, but because of XMP, we have better latency. And that latency actually does end up improving the overall performance. And I'm curious if the 6600H here, which is the same CPU architecture, they are both Zen 3, though this is Zen 3 Plus, the iGPU is drastically different. While this was seven Vega cores, this is six RDNA 2 cores. Of course, this is clocking at 2.2 gigahertz and this is capping out at 1.9, but we do have 24 gigabytes of RAM in here. Now I was going to use more RAM in here just so that we can have a saturated amount of RAM, but unfortunately I only have a 16 gigabyte kit that works with this because I tried to use this uh, 64 gigabyte kit that I have, but unfortunately the clock speeds that it goes to 3600 megahertz, it, the system itself literally just cannot boot like this. And it's fine. I mean, the, the timings themselves aren't exactly great on this kit anyway, but that does mean that we're going to run into some issues in terms of the RAM. I don't think it's too much of an issue though, because you could put as much RAM as, in here as you realistically would want up to a certain point, but then you're just completely pricing out a system like this. So I think 16 gigabytes is fine, but I I ended up actually running into another issue with this specific system. See, what I do with every computer that I test, I don't know if you could hear my dog drinking his water right now, but in all of the systems that I get, I try to allocate at least four gigabytes of RAM to the iGPU. This isn't really a performance thing as much as a, a just lets you launch certain games. A perfect example is Guardians of the Galaxy is a game that will not launch unless you have at least four gigabytes of VRAM allocated. Same with Horizon Zero Dawn. So being able to allocate Allocate more memory pretty much lets you be able to access these games and while they don't run remarkably well on here at least Horizon Zero Dawn doesn't it's still something nice to be able to do and unfortunately I don't know why but on this specific motherboard that I have here and that is an ASRock B550 ITX AC that motherboard for some reason in the BIOS even though it has the option to allocate more RAM and I've tried to allocate even all the way up to eight gigabytes just to see if I could get it to work it caps out at two gigabytes I don't know if it's a RAM capacity thing where if I had 32 gigabytes finally it would take effect but it just stays at two gigabytes and I cannot find a solution dated the BIOS I've looked around online I can't find anybody talking about this so I don't exactly know what the issue is there so we're gonna be sticking to just the games that will run on the frame buffer of these but I did want to show you guys that I ran into this issue so I'm very curious to see how this mini PC is gonna hold up against this ITX monster it's funny to think that this thing is just so big big in comparison to what computers are now because this case and everything was one of the smallest systems you could get just a few years ago which
which actually had decent power. See, there's been tiny computers for a very long time, but very rarely have been there have been tiny computers with decent amounts of power. Now I'm very curious to see if the desktop platform here is able to close the gap enough with the 6600H here since we never got a desktop 6000 series. It pretty much was only 5000 series and then we skipped all the way up to 8000 series. And consequently, we never got a desktop platform that actually has a proper RDNA 2 based iGPU that could use better RAM. See, one of the problems is that since this is, this is a first generation DDR5 system, the 4800 megahertz clock speed of the DDR5 RAM in here is honestly pretty terrible. Even 5600, which is standard now, isn't exactly great for these types of systems, but 4800 megahertz definitely has very loose timing. So I'm very curious if we can actually close the gap here, if there even is a gap. And I guess lastly, the disadvantage that the DIY system has is essentially the fact that the Vega iGPU is just not getting driver updates. This is on 24.10.1 and this is on 24.9.1. So a month difference, but again, just because this got a driver update doesn't mean there was optimization for it because the previous update before this was all the way in March. And before that, it was in November of last year. Vega is not getting any driver driver optimization. That's just the case here. So we're going to be testing out some brand new games, moving back towards older titles just to see where these systems actually land. So let's actually jump in and take a look at all that. So the first game that we're taking a look at is Black Myth Wukong running with the lowest in-game graphics settings. And we are using FSR with a resolution scaling of 66% and we do have frame generation on. On both systems, it's not exactly a great result. Both of them are pretty much at a 30 FPS average, though the 66 100H is leaning more towards 40, but the 1% lows are also pretty close to each other. In general, neither one's going to be that great considering the fact that we have frame generation on right now. But it also does show that there is not that big of a gap between these two specific systems right now, at least in this specific title, which is interesting to see, though the 6600H does have a clear lead. It's not by as big of a margin as you would expect considering the IPC increase that came from RDNA 2, but as I explained all of the downsides that come with the 6600H, this kind of makes sense. So moving on to the next game, the Talos Principle 2 running with the lowest in-game graphics settings and we are using FSR with the performance preset. In this one, it's a very similar situation though since the numbers, this is a clear win for the 6600H though again, it's more of a symbolic victory considering that neither one of them gives a very great result. Still, the improved 1% lows in particular on the 6600H does make the experience seem more consistent as you can tell by the frame time chart at the bottom where it's spiking up is very inconsistent on these 5600G, at least on the 6600H, it's a little bit more consistent. And of course, the next title is going to be Company of Heroes 3, running with the lowest in-game graphics settings, and we are using FSR, but at the quality preset. And in this one, the 6600H ends up taking a more meaningful lead, considering the fact that the 1% lows and the FPS average are seeing a pretty nice bump in comparison to the 5600G. This is one of those situations where you want to see that FPS increase, because this is one of those titles where, as the combat gets more intense, it can really bring things down. So it does show that the 6600H, even with all of its flaws in consideration, is still able to deliver a very meaningful improvement in terms of gaming performance. That's just nice to see considering the fact that it is an overall cheaper system than what I put together here. And the next game that I took a look at is Mountain Blade 2 Banner Lord, an absolute classic that I really love and we're running with the low in-game graphics settings. It's not the lowest that you can go, it's just one tier above that. But but here you can see that both systems are doing a really rock solid job in this title at this preset and this is what I recommend that you play the game at because the built in benchmark could be a little misleading if you get into the really really big battles in the cities while you're trying to capture them it will bog down a system like the 5600G and even the 6600H starts to struggle there though it is able to recover better. Not as big of a gap here in terms of the 1% lows though so it's not that meaningful of a victory but still that uplift in the FP FPS average and those 1% lows are going to lead to a more meaningful experience as you get further along the campaign here. So the next game that I took a look at is Tiny Tina's Wonderland running at 1080p with the low in-game graphics settings. Low is not the lowest that it'll go to, it's one above that similar to Mountain Blade Banner Lord, and we are using FSR at the quality preset.
yet. This is another one of those where we do see the 6600H take a pretty noticeable victory here, though both of them are below a 60 FPS average. The 6600H is giving a better result in both the 1% lows and the FPS average, though by not a gigantic margin. Considering we are below 60, any improvement is welcome, especially since we are above 30. You know, going from 15 FPS to 17 FPS is not really going to make that meaningful of a difference in terms of being able to play a game, but going from 42 to 48 on your FPS average just means that in those really intensive situations, you're less likely to really drop down, as you can see by those 1% lows. And the next game we're taking a look at is Total War Warhammer 3, running with the lowest in-game graphics settings, and we are running the big battle built-in benchmark. There is also one for the campaign. We're not going to do that one since the overworld doesn't really matter. But in terms of the actual gameplay, this is one where both systems were really starting to fall apart here. Both of them producing a sub-30 FPS average experience pretty much means that neither one is going to be all that playable. But the 6600H does actually have a lead here, and it is a consistent and noticeable lead. So it does get the win here, but again, neither one is going to give you a great experience here. You're going to have to drop the resolution down to 900p or 720p if you actually want to play a title like this on either system. And the next game that we're taking a look at is another all-time favorite of mine. It's Hitman World of Assassination running at the lowest in-game graphics settings, and we are using FSR, but at the quality preset, and my god, the gap in terms of performance here was kind of insane. A 38 FPS average with 1% lows of 29 on the 5600G versus the 50 FPS average and 42 1% lows on the 6600H. This is a clear and easy victory for the 6600H and is one of the biggest gaps that I've seen so far in all my testing. And it should be said that that is a jump that will make a meaningful difference in terms of your experience of actually playing the game. It's practically a generational difference, which it actually is this time around. And the last game that we're going to be taking a look at here is Counter-Strike 2. A title that has had a lot of issues trying to run on any Vega-based iGPUs on mini PCs. So it's interesting that the 5600G is actually able to play the game pretty close to how the 6600H is able to do it. It really seems like those improved timings and the higher overall clock speed of the CPU are really making up the difference here in comparison to other Vega based mini PCs. Even chips like the 5800H, which on paper should be more powerful than the Radeon 7 that is in the 5600G, that couldn't get anywhere near this level of performance. In particular, the 1% lows is where vega based mini pcs tend to struggle so the fact that it's this close is actually really impressive to me and probably one of the best results that i've seen for the 5600g in all of this testing because it is a playable experience and it's really great on either one of them which is pretty nice to see all right so after running all the tests on these systems we can pretty much see that the clear winner is of course going to be the mini pc here that's not really all that surprising considering the fact that we did have an architecture change in terms of the igpu so going from vega to rdna 2 pretty much came with about a 50 percent ipc uplift so even though it's one less core in terms of the igpu it did actually end up being pretty noticeably in the lead in some titles but in others it was actually pretty close. I have no doubt that they, if they had released a desktop version of this APU, you could have probably gotten some pretty crazy performance out of it. In particular, the fact that those six cores are clocked at only 1.9 gigahertz is very annoying. I would like to be able to at least go to 2.2. Remember the 12 core version of this iGPU, the one in the 6800M, that runs at 2.2 gigahertz, while that same 12 core iGPU on the 69, on the 6950H and the 6900HX runs at 24 runs at 2.4 gigahertz so this at only 1.9 is pretty far behind the rest of its siblings so if this could just be oc'd i can promise you it would close the gap but we would still run into the issue of the laptop ram it is pretty impressive how even though it is a more limited package here it still was able to deliver a better gaming experience and that just shows the improvement that came with going from Vega to RDNA 2, though that shouldn't be that surprising considering that Vega was around for a really long time. And I'm saying 
before the introduction of the 6600H. Vega is still around to this day. There are brand new chips, and I say brand new with the loosest definition possible. There are brand new chips coming out with Vega in them. So if gaming is at all a concern for you, you should either look towards a mini PC like this, since this, is, this whole package is cheaper than this entire system that I put together, and it performs better, and it has more RAM. But of course, if we were to go with AM5, we'd be spending more money than this by a good margin, but we would get the expandability of this, as well as the ability to overclock both the iGPU and the RAM. I just really wish that the 6600H, or specifically the 660M, had gotten some kind of desktop release so that we could really push this thing to its limit, but in all honesty, I'm still pretty happy with the results that you can get out of this thing, considering the price that you can pay for it. Again, this whole setup over here ended up costing more to put together than this little mini PC, and it's more compact, more power efficient. You saw it was using less power from the wall during the tests, and it was giving better performance. But of course, this does not mean that DIY is completely out of the question. I mean, you saw in the video before where I upgraded this thing with a two terabyte SSD, a one terabyte SSD, another one terabyte NVMe, as well as the one terabyte NVMe that's in there. Good luck trying to find a mini PC that has more than three NVMe slots, or even still supports SATA to this day. There is some flexibility with going down this route, especially since you have options in terms of how big you want the system to be. I mean, to be fair, this is already going towards about the limit of how small you could realistically go with at least if you want to keep the power supply internal if you're fine with an external brick you can get some systems that are almost this small but there's still going to be a noticeable difference because the motherboard standard alone is bigger than this so where does that leave a system like this in comparison to getting a mini pc well if you want a day-to-day -day system if you want a gaming computer if you just want something that is going to be a easy to set up easy to use computer a mini pc is kind of undefeated right now it really really is. I mean, something like this will be more than enough power for pretty much anybody, unless you have very, very specific workloads, and the improved iGPU means that you could actually do some gaming on here. This, on the other hand, is really great if you're trying to make a very low-budget NAS, and you really don't want to go down the route of hard drives. See, hard drives make sense for really massive amounts of storage, but they're loud, they run hotter, and they're way more likely to fail due to just the mechanical nature of them, though if you go with cheap SSDs, you kind of equalize that aspect of it. You could put in two 8 terabyte Evo SSDs, those SATA SSDs from Samsung, and you could put two NVMe SSDs in here that are also 8 terabytes if you wanted to. If the storage is all that matters to you, this is a really nice compact option because you could pretty much keep this anywhere and it won't take up that much space. Big downside there, of course, is just the fact that there is no upgrade path. It is a dead platform in the sense that AM4 is no longer going to get any relevant releases. I mean, they're still releasing CPUs for AM4, but those CPUs are essentially just refreshes of already existing products or weird in between SKUs of things that are already in. There has not been a new high end AM4 CPU in ages. It's all just mid tier or higher mid tier that have been getting released. I mean, the best thing that they've released recently is the 5700X3D for sure, but even then, that's just a worse version of the 5800X3D that is no longer being made. So you definitely have some options here just know that if you want to go with am4 this is about the limit you can go the with the 8700g but i think the 8700g might be pushing the limits of the power supply that i have in this one i know that the current generation of the in one chopin has a bigger power supply than what i already have here this one is only 150 watts i think the current one comes with 250 watts that should be enough for that one but you have to make sure which case you're getting there but again you end up in a situation where you're using more wattage than a system like this for worse performance at least in terms of gaming with that said though thank you guys for watching i really appreciate it check out the merch store down below check out all of these systems and parts and everything down below if you're interested in them let me know which one of these is the most interesting to you i know a lot of people are diehard diy fans so i'm curious to see what y'all's opinions are in terms of which route you would rather go with but i do want to test this system up against the 8600g and i think it would be also fun to compare this system along with it so we're gonna take a look at that in a later video be sure to subscribe again check out the merch store down below i appreciate you watching i'll catch you in the next one